once again introduce Peter Schulzer, who will give his second talk on locally symmetric spaces and gallery representations. Oh, thanks. All right, welcome back. Um, so in this talk, I want to uh, sketch the proof of the theorem. And uh, I apologize, it will be much more technical than the first talk. Um, so let's start right out with any totally real OCM field. And for some reason, I decided to switch notation to F. And so any n greater or equal to 1. And so uh, instead of this gamma, uh, I will switch to the adelic setup. So it's a subgroup of the finite adelic, finite adels of this field F. It's a compact open subgroup. And then what used to be called X gamma becomes XK. Um, so what are you doing? You're taking GLN of the adults of this field F. <coughs> and on the one hand, you're dividing by uh, K infinity, so that's a maximal compact subgroup of Um, the real part of the thing. So uh, if you were just dividing GLN of F tensor QR by K infinity, you would get the symmetric space like the uh, upper half plane or the three-dimensional hyperbolic space or something like this. And then this part is some totally disconnected thing. And so if I divide by this K, it just becomes some discrete set. And here I divide by GLN F. So this is really just a finite disjoint union of some symmetric space by some congruence subgroup. <coughs> and So then the theorem is that uh, for any system of Hecker eigenvalues, AP, where P is a prime of this field F, uh, which appear in uh, any homology group of two bar coefficients um, there exists some continuous Gaur representation rho uh, of the absolute Gaur group of F um, to a GLN F uh, such that for almost all P, uh, the trace of the Frobenius at P, um, so scar representations will be unramified almost everywhere. And so for any prime, you get a distinguished conjugacy class of elements, which are the Frobenius element at this prime P. And so this is supposed to be uh, the second eigenvalue AP. And again, there is a version of this result with Zmod P to the M coefficients here, which is slightly more technical to sketch. Uh, also, actually, you, ca um, you can even describe the whole characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, which is even necessary to uniquely identify this row in very small characteristic, but you can do this. Yeah. All right. Ah. So now I need a very big blackboard, and I already started to use the big scanner. Um, so, 
So I first wanted to draw a big diagram um, which summarizes uh, how the scholar representation is constructed. <clears throat> and so let's assume for the sake of this argument that, or for the sake of making uh, the objects slightly more explicit that as in the previous talk, this field is an imaginary quadratic field. Let me start here. <clears throat> so what you start with is the FP bar cohomology of the locally symmetric space for, uh, well, GLN over this field F. Okay, you have some, some class there. <clears throat> and then there was this question how to relate this to some algebraic variety. And I think it's an old suggestion by many people to embed it as a boundary uh, stratum using what's called the borel sec complexification uh, to an algebraic variety. So which is the algebraic variety, which is the element here? Get to the F bar, cohomology of the locally symmetric space uh, for <coughs> um, a quasi-split unitary group of signature NN uh, which will then live over, over Q. Um, so what happens is that this quasi-split unitary group has a so-called Siegel levy, who is a uh, Siegel parabolic, whose levy subgroup is exactly this group GLN over F. And <coughs> uh, this means that if you look at the Borosair competition, there will be one boundary stratum, which is essentially described by the local symmetric space of GLN over F. What's slightly surprising about this Borosair compactification is that even in the cases where you compactify some algebraic variety, as will happen in this case, it's just a compactification as a real manifold, even with corners, and so these non-algebraic ties can appear inside the boundary there. And so, I think Clozel or Harder or Skinner, um, I don't exactly know, uh, uh, was thinking of this idea for a long time. So the point here is that uh, this space is, is an algebraic variety over Q. <clears throat> and you might think that's great because now you could maybe try to play the same game as for the modular curve and look at its Ital cohomology and find a Gal representation there, so some Gal will collect. But unfortunately, the Gal representation that you see there is completely uninteresting. It's just some character. And so in the actual argument, it will actually play no role that this is defined over Q. I will only use the sky over Q bar in all these steps. Well, what happens is that you have some kind of long exact sequence describing the complex support cohomology of the sky and the cohomology of the sky and the cohomology of the boundary. Um, the crucial property of the compactification is that the embedding of the open part into the whole guy is in homotopy equivalence. Um, and so from this long exact sequence, you see that any system of Hecker eigenvalues in the boundary will either contribute to complex support cohomology or to cohomology, but using Poincare duality, you can somehow reduce to either of the two. It's just part, but uh, some, using some inductive argument on n, you can uh, get rid of the lower dimensional stuff. All right, so then comes the next step. Oops. Do, 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 do. Um, and that's the only step to which I contributed. Um, a certain lifting theorem, 
which tells you that whenever you are in the situation of some algebraic variety, so I guess it's technically called, called a Shimura variety, uh, and you have some Hecker eigenclass mod P, you can always lift it to characteristic zero. So you can always lift the Hecker eigenvalues to a system of Hecker eigenvalues to a cusp form on this UNN. And so this means that there is some cuspal automorphic representation on this quasi split unitary group. And then uh, it was, for these guys, it was already known that they are Galois representations. But the fact that this was known is some, uh, a major achievement in the area um, using the work of many, many, many people. And I'll show to many, name a few. So the first step is that you go to. lift these guys to conjugate soft dual representations of GL2n over this field F again. Um, so that's the case of what's called Langens functoriality, which relates automorphic forms on different groups, and which was, which we're going to take because it falls under the cases which one can handle using endoscopy, uh, in this case, twisted endoscopy. And so, sorry? Oh, you mean if I start with something here, um, then it would not be a cusp form, it would just be an Eisenstein series. So it's critical that I lift to a cusp form here because otherwise I couldn't do this. Or, yeah, otherwise the rest of the argument would fail. So, uh, Harris, Lund, Taylor, and so on use the same strategy for automorphic representations here. But then what they would construct here would be some kind of Eisenstein class on this unitary group. And they would still have to produce congruence to cusp forms to go on. And that's what they did. Um, so I guess Labesse proved some result here. And then the result I need was proved by Shin, and they were related to the result of Sophie Morel. Uh, then Arthur proved. Also in his book, proved this for symplectic and orthogonal groups and mock and not the same for unitary groups. But I mean, all of this relies critically on the fundamental lemma of Ngo and for these later works on the stabilization of the twisted trace formula and many other works of Paul Spurgey. So that's a huge body of work. <coughs> um, and then there is a theorems which tell you that for conjugate soft dual representations, automorphic representations, you have Galois representations. And so how does this work? Well, you reverse the last step. That sounds stupid. But uh, you go to a slightly different unitary group. You go to a unitary group of a different signature. So I guess all these people, I should put back in here, descend to the other side. And now, <coughs> here you can go to representations, Galois F2, GL2N, uh, and this is just uh, using the Atal cohomology of the relevant Shimura varieties. So what happens is that uh, on these Shimura varieties, you didn't see the correct R representation, and neither will you do here. But for this guy, you can really do what you did for the case of the modular curve where you found this elliptic curve. You can do the precise analog of that, and you actually get the correct R representations. And so uh, I guess the names to mention here are Kotlitz and then Kvosel, which had results in the 90s, and then these were stringent by Harris Taylor, their famous book, and then completed by Shin and Shinibi Harris. And so, uh, what did we do? We started with this F Pivar cohomology class, went all this way, and got this representation to GLN 2 and QP bar, which is not quite what we wanted. Um, 
So first of all, it depended on lifting at one point. So let's forget about the lifting and go to the residue field again. So we can reduce and go mod p. And then we wanted an n-dimensional representation, and we produced a two-n-dimensional representation, but then you can show that this decomposes as a di direct sum of an n-dimensional guy, and essentially it's dual. And then you, you have it. Okay. The new theorem is when you go from left to right, yeah. So all the solid arrows were uh, known before. And I guess also the general strategy of doing it like this was known. I mean, for example, Harris, Lam, Taylor, and so on, some have proved it for these uh, automorphic representations uh, using this kind of thing. Yeah, so this actually shows up. Uh, in essentially, all cases it shows up in the talk of you see Shimura right here. Yeah, for that case, you have a motive, yeah. But, I mean, if you start with an automorphic representation there, then this only gives you the mod p part of the Gal representation as punging for a motive, or then the mod p to the m part, et cetera. But it, <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> uh. Right. Well, the, so what I'm about to state, someone says that for Shimura varieties, this doesn't really happen. Shimura varieties don't have a big torsion part. It's only these non-algebraic varieties which have this big torsion part. And yeah. So the reason that, I, so I think the reason that such lifting theorem is possible is precisely that this is an algebraic variety. Uh, Let's state this result. So let's consider a Shimura variety, and it's not quite general. It's what I, what's called a Hodge type. Uh, but many, many guys are of this form. And you could conceivably extend this to a Boolean type using not so much work. Um, Hodge type means there exists an embedding of the Shimura variety into the Zigo moduli space of principally polarized Abelian varieties. Um, and so if you had generalized this to a Abelian type, which should be possible, then many, many Shimura varieties are of the Abelian type, but not all. Um, so for exceptional groups, this doesn't apply. Um, so for any system, AP, of Hecker eigenvalues. <coughs> Appearing in uh, cohomology with FP bar coefficients. There exists a classical cusp form I'm not sure why I say classical. I mean there exists a cusp cuspal eigen form, I should say. F on well maybe not on the same single variety. Um maybe on some slightly different level k prime. So. The same group. The same group. <laughs> uh, so it has, all I'm doing is I'm increasing the level at p. 
So there's larger level at P. Uh, oops. Uh, yes, uh, such that the Hecke eigenvalues of F are congruent to these given ones mod P. So again, let me make a couple of remarks about this. <coughs> oh. One is a remark uh, related to this question that already came up. So <coughs> what happens here is that I'm interested in the theorem for classes which come from the boundary. And even if they come from the boundary, I lift them to a cusp form. So in particular, This provides congruences between Eisenstein series and cusp forms. Um, such congruences were. Uh, used in many instances in number theory, beginning with Ribbett's proof of the Kovmos to Herbrand theorem and then Wiles' proof of the main conjecture and so on. Um, I think the congruences I'm producing here, they are not precise enough to allow such applications. But uh, anyway, they're good enough for that. Um, but it's also interesting uh, in the compact case, so when there is uh, no boundary, um, it still says that, so for example, for a compact unitary Shimura variety, you know, will know that there are gar representations for all cusp forms, and hence the theorem also tells you that for all, for all compact unitary Shimura varieties, you will have gar representations attached to torsion classes. Um, I want to mention that in that case, uh, in a very recent preprint with uh, Anna Karayani, uh, the same result is proved uh, with one important difference that instead of increasing the level at P, we increase the level at some other auxiliary prime L not equal to P. And moreover, we show that in many cases there, actually there is no torsion at all. So everything, all the cohomology is concentrated in middle degree and uh, thus torsion free. Um, so I'm confirming uh, this philosophy that for Shimura varieties there should not be so much torsion. Um, yeah. Doop, 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 doop. Do I continue? Um. <coughs> So what happens in the theorem is that somehow we have to go from a singular cohomology, <coughs> so mod p class and singular cohomology, uh, to actually functions on the space, or differential forms or something like this. Uh, so the way to do this classically over the complex numbers, um, this is done using Hodge theory. And 
So here we are in a periodic setting. And so what we will do is we use some uh, slightly integral periodic Cauchy theory. So now it somehow needs to be integral, so not with QP coefficients, but with ZP coefficients because we're interested in this thing mod P. And the last thing I wanted to say about the proof, and then I will, yeah. So I don't actually want to give the proof, but I want to say the geometry that enters the proof. And so yeah, the proof makes very heavy use of certain facts about the periodic geometry of these more varieties. Right. <coughs> so what I will do in the rest of the talk uh, I want to explain this geometry in the simplest case. So now we go back to the modular curve. So, so we're back in the setup. We have gamma in SL2Z. And we look at what we call this M gamma, gamma Q, given whose complex points are the upper half plane. Oops, sorry. Um, and so this guy here is a moduli space of elliptic curves with some level, level structure corresponding to gamma. <coughs> and so The periodic analog, sorry, I want to explain something uh, over the periodic field, but I first want to uh, draw the similar diagram over the complex numbers where it's something very well known. So what, namely, let's contemplate taking the inverse limit of the complex value points of M gamma, the inverse limit over all subgroups gamma as gamma shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. So what happens then is that we're taking the quotient by smaller and smaller subgroups, and then up to some issue of z hat versus c, uh, we just get the upper half plane again. And so um, in modular theoretic terms, what the up upper half plane would do is that the parameterizes pairs e and alpha, where e over c is an elliptic curve, And alpha is a trivialization of the first single homology. Uh, I guess to just get the upper half plane, I have to ask that it's orientation preserving. So maybe the group I'm actually working with is really SL2 and not GL2. Um, but of course, some of the upper half plane tautologically sits inside the complex projective line, right, just by its very definition. And what does this mean in, in modular theoretic terms? So modular theoretic terms, what you would be doing is you take your elliptic curve as a trivialization of the first homology, and you map it to its Hodge filtration. Namely, what happens is that uh, why is this map alpha? 
uh, C2 is identified with the first single homology tensor C, but <coughs> this is just the first DRAM homology, if you want, which subjects onto the Lie algebra of C. So this means that the Lie algebra of E gives you a varying one-dimensional quotient of this fixed two-dimensional complex vector space, i.e. an element of P1. So we want a PNIC analog of that. And so if you need one such a periodic analog, so I guess I will now work over uh, this periodic analog of the complex numbers, which is just QP, you take an algebraic closure, but now it's not complete anymore, so you complete again. And then it turns out that it's still algebraically closed, so there's some complete algebraically closed field containing the periodic numbers, and some of the periodic analog of the complex numbers. And so we need an analog of the Hodge filtration. <coughs> so that's, let me talk for a moment about uh, Hodge filtrations over CP. Um, So if you were with the complex numbers, then in Hodge theory, I guess you were, would probably be studying compact complex manifolds. And so the periodic analog of Z is what's called a proper smooth rigid analytic variety. So examples of this would just be proper smooth variety. Uh, but they are non-algebraic such guys, and just as they are non-algebraic complex, complex manifolds. And the whole story I'm about to explain uh, works as well for those as for, uh, as for the algebraic guys. In what we're doing, we are probably only interested in the case where e x is an elliptic curve, uh, where everything I'm about to say is much easier. But I wanted to give the general, uh, like what it looks like in general general picture. First, we have the following theorem, which is follows from uh, classical Hodge theory, and then maybe slightly extended by the lean, if x happens to be algebraic. And what's essentially proved in my paper on periodic Hodge theory, if it's not defined over CP, but over a finite extension, but then uh, Conrad and Gubber uh, proved a result that you can always spread out rigid analytic varieties. So using their argument, one can extend this. One can prove this in general. Um, it's about the Hodge-Durham spectral sequence. So the Hodge-Durham spectral sequence, uh, which start in one term, uh, is are the Hodge cohomology groups. And it converges <coughs> to the Durham cohomology groups. Uh, it degenerates at E1. So this might be slightly surprising because in the complex case, this is not always true. 
but instead uh, you need to put some Cato assumption or something like this. Uh, but in the PID case, it's just always true. Um, it's actually slightly funny to look at examples of non kähler complex manifolds and see whether they have an algebraic analog. So for example, there's a hop surface, which does have a periodic analog, but fortunately for the hop surface, the hot to drum spectral sequence degenerates. But on the other hand, there's the Iwasawa manifold where it does not degenerate, but that one fortunately doesn't have a periodic analog. So <laughs> everything's good. Yeah. Um, and so in particular, we get a hot to drum filtration on the drum And so in this diagram I was drawing uh, over the complex numbers, that's what we use to get, to get this kind of period map there. Um, however, uh, we were also using in between this isomorphism. It's a comparison between singular cohomology and drum cohomology. And this is not true in this form of the complex numbers. Over CP, if you look at, well, I guess it uh, singular cohomology is replaced by tall cohomology, and you can extend this to CP. This is not canonically isomorphic to I mean, there are vector spaces of the same dimension you can check, but uh, so they are abstractly isomorphic. But at least in families, it really doesn't work. Um, So technically, I think you, well, you need contains famous field of periodic periods called Dr. And so this means that whatever we're doing in this tower of modular curves, we're somehow parameterizing part of singular or etal cohomology. But this hot drum filtration doesn't give us any filtration here. So we need something different. And so that's second theorem. So this is due to Tate 2067 for IBM varieties. Uh, faultings in 1990 if X is algebraic and maybe defined over a finite extension of QP instead of CP. Although this method probably works in general. Um, and then, again, with the same caveat that you approved, so I proved this uh, in the case of a finite extension, and then this result of Conrad and Gabber allows one to handle the case of a CP. Um, so that's the problem. Um, that there is another very similar looking but different spectral sequence which converges to these etal cohomology groups, and that's what I call the hodge tate spectral sequence. Um, so it comes with two interesting twists. Um, the first is that I and J are interchanged, and I hope I have them in both places in the right order. Um, and on the other hand, there's a state twist which appears here, which actually over CP doesn't really make any sense, but if it's, you know, it's better to put it. Um, and it converges to the Etal cohomology tender CP. It's actually, Well, so what happens is that uh, if you have a finite extension, of course, you can base change to CP and get the spectral sequence. Uh, but to get a Gower equivariant, you should better put the state twist here. And again, it degenerates at the first page. It degenerates at page two. And so thus, you get what they call the hot state filtration. On the Etal cohomology tender. 
And now this is something we can actually use. So when do I need to stop? So uh, let me explain this in an example, uh, which is somewhat relevant example. So let's take either CP and elliptic curve. <coughs> so then there are two different filtrations. So one is a classical filtration, which you have on, let's talk about the RAM homology. Uh, So first, the RAM homology of an elliptic curve is, I guess, the same as the Lie algebra of the universal vector extension. So it subjects onto the Lie algebra of E, and the kernel is uh, the dual of the Lie algebra of the dual elliptic curve. Well, for an elliptic curve, I shouldn't have to put the dual, but <laughs> if it wasn't a BM variety, I better put the dual. Okay. Um, and You have a similar exact sequence for the periodic Tate module. So the first, uh, it's our homology. And now the two terms are interchanged. This corresponds to the interchanging of I and J in the spectral sequence. And here, you so you have the Lie algebra of E as a kernel. And actually, it gets Tate twist by one. So let's get back to the modular curve. Um, so if you look at this, so we want to use this filtration here. Um, and so to get, to get a nice filtration of a fixed vector space, we better trivialize some of this periodic Tate module. So after fixing, an isomorphism called this alpha again between TP and TP squared, we get a hot, what I call the hot state period. So that's the content of the point serum. <coughs> which works for any Shimura variety of Hodge type. But I'll state it only for the modular curve. <coughs> um, so just like over the complex numbers, um, we have all these nice modular curves, which are algebraic curves for each finite level. But now we want to go to infinite level. We just we're not parameterizing such isomorphisms about any power of p, but for all of them simultaneously. And over the complex numbers, as someone meant, we had to go to this complex upper half plane, which has no, no algebraic structure anymore. Um, in the periodic case, again, you have to pass to some world of such rich algebraic varieties. But the problem is that these only work nicely uh, under some finite type assumptions. And these turn out to fail completely uh, for the kind of objects we want to consider. And so the object that, that you actually get is one of these more fancy objects, which are called perfectoid spaces. Uh, M gamma infin P infinity over CP. And so let me just say what its CP points are. So it parameterizes Paris E alpha, where
E over CP is an elliptic curve. And alpha is such an ideal. <coughs> and uh, I want to explain something about this geometry in a second, which will make it clear that this is really some weird kind of object. Um, but let me first say on the second part that there is some other solid state period map as you would expect. Uh, well, also the right hand side is somewhat considered as a rigid analytic variety. I mean, it's what you would think. So it takes E alpha and then it maps it to the such state filtration. CP squared is Y alpha identified with the Tate module of E times the CP. And then this has a varying one dimensional quotient, which is now, there's a slight difference that this time you don't get the Lie algebra of E as a quotient, but the dual of the Lie algebra of the dual elliptic curve. <coughs> A fun fact about this is that it contracts heck operates away from P. So it contracts GL2 or SL2. I don't know which group I'm really working with. Uh, all this. Which may appear surprising because usually you would think of such an orbit as being dense in the, in the curve. But now there's a non-constant mapping to some interesting variety. So this means that Actually, they are not as dense as you would have thought, maybe. <coughs> and so I wanted to end by uh, drawing the following diagram. <coughs> so I have this modular curve at infinite level at P and maps to this P1 over CP. <coughs> and now there's a stratification of the space according to reduction type. So there is a part where the super sing elliptic curves have super singular reduction. There is a part where they have ordinary reduction, and then there is some part where they have bad reduction. Um, you don't have to talk about potentially something because you're already over CP all the way up. Um, and so I claim that there's a related stratification of uh, P1 into the QP rational point of P1 and the upper half plane, well, the periodic upper half plane. So that's just the complement. So it's P1 minus the rational points. So it's a period, so it's Greenfeld's periodic upper half plane. Where the analogy comes about by thinking about the usual upper, upper and lower half plane. And so P1 of C minus the points of P1, which are already defined over the base of P1 of R. All right. And so what happens is that these parts, which are some open parts of this variety, they get completely contracted down to points. But this map is a nice, a nice non-constant map. So connected components of M ort union embed are contracted to points. Uh, but this map here is highly non-constant, so this is interesting.
on. So Right, so uh, this, this, this map in this case is just, uh, right, so inside the periodic Tate module, if it or has ordinary reduction, it has a canonical subgroup, which gives you a canonical line, and that's what the map does. And this still works for a bad reduction. But there is something much more interesting happening at the, uh, what was the super singular look? I mean, usual algebraic geometry, this really couldn't happen that you have a map from a curve to another curve, which is constant on some parts and then interesting on some other parts and some weird geometry. Um. So let me explain what happens on the super singular part, which is actually quite interesting. So the super singular part has a periodic uniformization uh, as a finite disjoint union of so-called lumen Tate spaces at infinite level. So what happens is that if you look at the usual modular curve without any level mod P, then it has finitely many super singular points. And in the genetic fiber, this gives you finitely many open unit disks. And then as we pass up the tower over each such unit disk, you get what's called the Lubin Tate tower. And at each point, you somehow get the same thing because by said Tate theory, uh, yeah, everything depends only on the PD of group, which is always the same. And so you get finitely many copies of this Lubin Tate tower. That's right, yeah. Uh, but then there is this mysterious isomorphism originally due to faultings and then uh, worked out by Farag and in the form that it's used here as an isomorphism of perfectoid spaces appears in my joint work with Jared Weinstein uh, that this is isomorphic at infinite level to a completely different tower. So this is a tower of, open, uh, of covers of the open unit disk and this is a tower of covers of precisely this periodic upper half plane. And so this means that by its very definition, this side maps down to omega two and is some um, kind of co-finite etal cover. So it's an inverse limit of finite etal cover. And so that's, that's what the state period map does on this part. So it's somehow knows about the isomorphism between the two towers. And so let me just say one word about uh, the strategy of proving, uh, of the proof of the lifting theorem. Which is actually uh, also the strategy in my recent work with Anna Karayani where, we, where I said that we proved a slight variant of this result where instead of increasing the level at P, we do it at some other point L. And maybe I would have to rename P and L once I want to discuss this. Um, is to understand the cohomology of this infinite level modular curve or more generally some infinite level Shimura varieties using the Liberier spectral sequence corresponding to pi Hodge state. So what's nice about the situation is that uh, the Heckhoff is away from P, they act trivially on this side. So somehow you can isolate systems of Hecker eigenvalues already on this space instead of only on the cohomology and this helps. Right. 
Sorry, say that again. Right. Uh, it also can, yeah. So, I mean, you have the hack hack operators uh, away from P, which act on this space via correspondences. And so they ha these correspondences have some orbits up here, but each orbit gets mapped to a point. And that's not very surprising for the things in the ordinary locus because they anyway get connected to a point. But, like, for super singular guys, it may be slightly surprising. Uh, it's true because the definition of this um, hot state filtration actually only uses the P homology and is not sensitive to what happens somehow with the L homology for prime difference. Yeah. Right. So in the end, you prove that the two n-dimensional guy you produce is the direct sum of an n-dimensional guy and its complex conjugate dual or something like this, twisted by one. And so the way you isolate the part, which is also actually also already appeared in, in the Harris Taylor Soren, is that you you construct this two n-dimensional representation, but you can also construct it for all twists of the original guy. And then the twist will actually do different things in the two direct summons, and then you can somehow take an isotopic component for this twisting. Well, uh, so what happens over the complex numbers is that you always have this Borel embedding of this, uh, of this bounded symmetric domain into its compact dual. And so that's some flag variety, and you use essentially the same flag variety in the PID case. That's the P1, yeah. Actually, it's a dual flag variety in some sense because, because of this. It pieces appeared the other way around. 